Hi, my name is Dustin Grass. I'm Senior Advisor for Medical Physics at the ACR. I'm in a conference room with uh, Lauren Hicks and Laura Coombs and Chris Trimmel. Chris is Director of Operations for the ACR's Data Science Institute. Laura is Senior Director of Informatics here at the ACR. And we are here to provide you some information about the ACR Data Science Institute. Uh, those of you who know me probably are aware that I started here uh, in May. Uh, I left MD Anderson Cancer Center and I was delighted to learn that the ACR Data Science Institute or DSI actually existed. And so um, I talked to my colleagues here at the ACR and we decided a, a good thing would be to uh, host a webinar uh, so that some of my medical physics colleagues can learn a little bit about the uh, ACR DSI. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Laura and Chris. Um, one housekeeping note, if you have questions, please punch them into the box. We will uh, monitor them as we go. So with that, Chris and Laura, thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dustin. Um, so as you said, my name is uh, Chris Trummel. I'm the Director of Operations here for the DSI. And um, I wanted to quick start things out with just kind of an overview of the DSI, uh, who we are, why we exist, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so I, I'd like to kind of start this slide out because a little bit of, um, you know, we hear all this hype around how AI is going to, you know, dramatically change the landscape of how we deliver med um, you know, medicine and healthcare to patients. And, uh, will, you know, folks have been trying to do this now for a little while now, and it, it hasn't really been stacking up. And uh, folks in medical imaging tend to be a little more in the tech you know, techno technologically savvy area. And so a lot of folks have been trying this out and understand AI around this. And really, where I think where the ACR came in is we we saw that that the current AI technologies could be highly beneficial to the patient care that we're delivering, um, but they're just not quite hitting the mark of what's out there today. So that that's really I think the core of why we started the DSI. That kind of really drives us. We wanted to see what what is it that that's preventing this technology from really being deployed into clinical practices to really benefiting patients. And what can can the ACR and the DSI do to help fill those gaps? Whether it's it's you know taking active roles, helping coordinate, or different areas like that. So then, as we we bring about our mission, our mission then is to really help let's advance the field of AI and medical imaging to benefit our patients, to benefit our clinicians, our, our professionals, and societies as a whole. So a few different areas. So one is trying to really leverage the the value of our professionals as it's evolving to make sure that what we're going after with this technology is the correct scenario, the correct workflow integration to make sure it's as impactful as possible. Um, really also making sure that we're protecting patients and looking for the patient's best interests as well um, by looking through how do we make sure that the regulatory processes are looking for safety and concern and then how do we actually make sure that these different algorithms that are being deployed or being developed are going to be benefiting for all patients, including marginalized patients um, overall. Um, we're also looking at establishing industry relations. So uh, by working with in folks out in industry to help make sure that the right ecosystems are set up, working with federal agencies like the FDA um, and different pathways for clinical integration, um, that way, as these technologies are actually progressing, we can make sure they have as large and as far-reaching as impact as possible. So the most possible amount of folks and patients can get benefit from it. Um, and then also, just I mean, we, we see this as an area where over time, this is going to be part of just naturally the whole part of this area of, of, of healthcare, and I think most areas of healthcare overall. Um, and so making sure that our, our folks involved in medical imaging, radiology professionals and physicians understand um, what AI is and how it's going to play out and incorporate into their um, into their education and, and into their work to make sure they can take advantage of it as best they can. So because of that, we kind of layered out, there's a, a few different or a bunch of different domains that we're kind of working in from, um, and I'll touch on use cases in a little bit too, but from use cases to some of the legal and ethical areas to payments, to integrations, regulatory um, development, training data, we saw a lot of different spots as we've been talking with um, with patient advocacy groups, with other societies, with government regulatory bodies, with industry of where, um, where where infrastructure or help and coordination is needed to help really bring bring this technology to fruition. I just want to quick to little talk about our team. So um, from a leadership standpoint, we have a few folks, Laura who's on the phone with me, uh, Mike Tilkin as well, who's the CIO of uh, the ACR. And we also have uh, Keith Dreyer and Bib Allen, who's our uh, Chief Science Officer and Chief Medical Officer um, as well. 
And then we have a, a, a team that we're building up here in the ACR as part of the DSI. And the DSI is also um, really embedded into the, the very fabric of the ACR. So you might look at this screen and kind of look at it and be like, well, that's not necessarily a lot of people, which is true. And that's because a lot of what we're doing is we're trying to, and we're working towards leveraging a lot of the existing teams and tools we already have at the ACR. So we work across the entire organization as well to make sure that not only is the, the work that we're doing as effective as possible, but then also making sure that as this change, it just naturally becomes part of all these different areas too. And then we also have a, a group of chief science or science officers as well that are um, uh, point people for a lot of different areas like terminology, clinical collaboration, education, methodology um, that help guide us and give us advice. And then we reach out to them as well for various different activities that, that, that are going on. Um, and then we also have uh, a few different things too. So we have our use case panels, which I'll talk about in a moment, and then an advisory committee as well that kind of we work with to make sure that what we're doing is the right thing, we're focusing on the right priorities, and then also making sure that the, the different advancement work we're doing is filtering correctly to different areas as well. So on the right side of the screen, you can see we're working with different folks from say, you know, the Journal of the American College of Radiology, the Commission on Radiology Oncology, uh, patient advocacy, private practice groups, um, uh, physics groups as well. And then a lot of what we're focusing on to, I'd say prior a very direct one off of this, is we're really focusing on how do we take AI from this kind of research concept-based area in medicine right now to really the clinical practice. And so we're doing a lot of collaboration on that. So a lot, doing a lot of cross-society collaboration. So for instance, um, one of the needs to really make sure AI can come to play is having a, a common data, a, a set of common data elements out there. And so we have a, a project with RSNA called Rad Elements, um, and we're also working with other subspecialty societies on that as well to fill it out, like ASNR. Um, in terms of AI imaging channels, we we are collaborating with other groups such as Mackay, which um, I think just wrapped up or is wrapping up in the next couple of days their annual meeting. We also have an, um, some inter a lot of international coordination as well. So we last year we formed um, the International um, CEO Council. So that's of CEOs from folks such as the ACR, the ECR, um, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and other areas like that to make sure that across societies we're all working together on on bringing this forward. And then just other terms of life cycle activities too. So for instance, working with SIM and ASNR on different areas that they're interested in to make sure that we're working together in a, in a co-beneficial way across the board. And just also on the folks collaboration, also working a lot with industry. So we're working on doing different workshops and advancements to the different standards bodies that we are looking at as being necessary to really make sure this happens, such as HL7, DICOM, IHE, and other standards organizations. Um, we're doing different, we've been doing different DSI summits, um, such as the last one we have was on economics, the one before that we have was on validation, and also different demonstration projects we're working on with government bodies and industry, and, and also with members to kind of show here's how some of these different activities can really play out in the real world. Um, and then just some of the other I just want to throw up, some of the, the other activities we're doing. So um, we have a joint quality and safety and um, data science conference uh, this October. I think it's from October 26th to the 28th in Boston. Uh, we have the, the journal data science columns. We have um, a journal advisor that we're putting together to focus on AI um, uh, journal uh, posts. We have the AI Journal Club. We have monthly blogs on our DSI website around different areas around AI that, that affect radiology professionals. We're spinning up a new web series uh, of radiologists' involvement in AI as well and radiology professional involvement, along with creating different white papers on intellectual property, data sharing, and different areas that folks are looking for best practices on. And this is the quick timeline of some of, the, some of the major milestones we've had since our inception in May 2017. Um, Still a lot more. Uh, we're at, we're right now we just have it running up to December 2018, but we already have kind of the entirety of 2019 packed as well. I just didn't want to throw it on there because then that gets to the point where things are too too compact and too much information. So um, changing gears just slightly, then going off of that, I want to talk about I think kind of our three kind of major pillars that we're working towards. Um, and at Certify AI, Assess AI, and Touch AI, and you might see a trend there. We like just adding everything with Dash AI. Um, but really where that came from is during our first, I, I'd say, kind of year of being created, we, we were talking a lot with, with, um, with members, with regulatory bodies, with industry, um, and diff different folks to kind of see, you know, what are the major struggles that, that's going on in applying AI to healthcare? 
And, and where does that kind of intersect with what the ACR is, is best at? And one of the major points that came off that is, is testing and validation. Um, because so much of how AI works today, and there is advancement going on in this area, is it's very black boxy. It, it, you did a lot of training on a certain scenario. You can, you can show that it works well under, under different test sets, but you can't really explain exactly how it works, at least not at this point in time. And, and what folks were trying to do then at different organizations is trying to take that on themselves. And it was very different, I think, from how a lot of other software systems and device systems have worked in the past. So this was an area that we, we were working on with folks saying this, you know, this spot makes a lot of sense for the ACR to be involved in. We're already involved with a lot of accreditation processes already. Um, and we, part of what we do is just helping make sure that there's, there's a good level of quality that you can trust going from there. So what Certify AI is essentially is to say is um, if a vendor makes an AI algorithm that's trying to accomplish a certain scenario, they can bring it to us as a independent third party to test their, the evaluation of how that actually performs in a data set that they haven't you know, created themselves, they haven't been exposed to themselves. Um, and then we can bring that back to them and let them know here's how it's actually playing out in a very highly diverse data set. Um, we're working with folks like the FDA as well to make sure that, that it can go through in there. Um, but then also as folks on the line and maybe who are involved with um, procuring devices and software and deploying it today, there is the testing aspect. And then you also have the part where after you actually put it live because it passes your test, you want to monitor it for quite a while because you have to actually playing out in the real world. Um, and this is no different um, except at a much larger scale. And so that's what we have with the CES AI, and we're, that's our what we're calling our post-market surveillance, or very uh, very similar to registries, where as um, an AI is being deployed at different uh, departments or, or locations across the United States, um, it's a fee we can do to actually see how it's truly working in the real world across different populations, across different sets of clinicians and users. Um, and as we were going through that, one of the other things you kind of realize with that is that if you're going to you know, say, we're gonna test what you're trying to go for, we're gonna help monitor in the real world. Part of what you also need to do there as well is say that, how are you gonna define what it is you've been going for? Um, and this is an area too, where as we started talking with industry, we saw actually a lot of need behind this that uh, a lot of our members and, and, and different um, folks like ours can, can really bring a lot of benefit from. And that's really defining what is the problem you're trying to solve with AI. Um, so I'd like to take a, a few minutes to, to dive into that a bit. So what we did with, um, we're calling that Touch AI, it's technically oriented use cases for healthcare, um, acronyms are fun, um, is so what we did is we, we formed different expert panels in different, uh, different subspecialty areas. So for instance, we have um, a, a panel for MSK, a panel for neuro, a panel for oncology. And what these panels do, they're comprised of about 10 experts in the area. As they look at an idea for, uh, for AI in healthcare, and they try they evaluate for how can we make sure it has the what's the best clinic or the highest clinical impact we, that this could happen from it what are some of the nuanced details off of this and this is an interesting one too because what's happened in the past um, is there's a bit of this gap between the technical folks and the clinical folks especially now with ai because with ai it is, a lot of it ends up being is the data you trained on how diverse is it how representative how representative was it and a lot of that becomes these really, really nuanced details in the clinical um, aspects of the patients and in the technical aspects of the modalities that did this as well. And if you miss those, it can cause vast um, uh, problems throughout the algorithm. And then also based on that too, having data parameters. And then a big part of this too is not just to say there's this one panel doing this, but we also have public input as well, um, submitting ideas and giving feedback on these as well. So, Essentially, the kind of life cycle of one of these use cases is we, we get an idea, and what we have right now is these ideas have just to kind of kick things off have come from the panels themselves. But our goal is is that um, as these go live online, which will happen in the next month, is we want the majority to come from outside sources, um, from just other folks in the clinical world, from vendors, from patient advocacy groups, to say, you know, here's an idea that we think AI would be helpful for us. Go through a prioritization project with the different panels, um, as they prioritize it, um, it gets drafted up with initial draft. They go through internal review on those panels until they feel that it's ready for public consumption. Um, after they go through their review process, then we post it to be publicly reviewed on the DSI website where um, anyone can add their comments to it, add their questions to it to make sure that we're as being as robust as we possibly can. And that goes on for about two months, and then we go to final. And then once it's finalized, um, not that we can't ever come back to it again, but it means that 
industry and other folks should be able to know that this is a pretty solid site to work off of. So I'll, I'll go over one example with pneumothorax, but before I hit that one, it's kind of lay out the, the, the general outline of how these work is that every use case has a, has a standard, have, we have a standard template, and they go through a bit of a description, what this is, what it's trying to accomplish, uh, a clinical implementation that describes here's a clinical scenario where this could be used for, um, data set development, so what are the types of variations you need to have in your data set to actually be represented, representative of the real world, um, and technical specifications and future ideas. So going over an example of pneumothorax here, um, and this I, I've taken from one of our finalized one. We just have a top section that kind of explains the high level, what this is here for, what it's trying to do, um, where this came from, um, licensing stature, we're, we're planning putting all these under Creative Commons 4, so that way it's freely available for everyone to use and to reference, along with the current status. So this one would be coming out in the public commenting status pretty soon, and then or if it was finalized. First section being clinical implementation. So in this particular scenario, um, what this was going after is to be able to say, let's prioritize a work list. Um, is we detect a pneumothorax on a chest X-ray, and based on that one, we want to prioritize the work list. And, and where this is really important for us and, and for industry and for the folks is based on what this scenario is, um, that's going to have a lot of vast repercussions off of um, what level of specificity and what level of need you need to be able to come from this. So if you're trying to prioritize a work list, the level of risk is a bit less than, say, let's, you know, um, what you're trying to do is automatically detect pneumothorax and alert, you know, an ED physician that they need to order um, interventions automatically without any human intervention. That'd be a much higher level of risk. Um, and so that, that, bleed, that then breaks down into what level of details we need to go into and what level of um, uh, acceptability do we have under our certified AI test for this as well. Um, I think this is this is a really important part too, is this considerations for data set development. Um, so what this is is say for this particular scenario, for this detection of pneumothorax, um, what folks will do is they'll grab a, a data set. So we're saying this is for a chest x-ray, is what are the types of variations inside a chest x-ray do you need to make sure you're accounting for? Um, and this is where we've seen a lot of folks in industry stum stumble today. Um, a fair amount of that's because I think it's a, that gap between the technical and the clinical side where from the technical side, what you know is that you can get this off a chest X-ray. Um, if you can get ground truth from some way, shape, or form, whether it's from reports or from some discrete values, um, what's not clear then is if you find a data set, is that data set actually diverse and encompassing enough? And that's what the goal of this is, to try and say, here's, here's all the different diversity pieces that you need to worry about if you're creating this. Um, so for instance, some easy ones like sex at birth and age, but then also other things like other types of um, comorbidities or other types of uh, patient conditions that can come into play. So for instance, in Medorax, you might need to worry about different types of chest wall injuries, where rib fractures need to be accounted for in addition to not having rib fractures. Um, what type of collapse is it? Is it partial or complete? You need to make sure if you're going to train, you can do both. Um, even I really like some of the really kind of on the technical side things that folks want to think about, like skinfold artifacts. Um, so for instance, on that one, there's a clinical note that says skinfold artifacts, most common cause of false positives in there. So if you were to train an algorithm and you never once accounted for skinfold artifacts and made sure you were accounting for them correctly, odds are the first time your algorithm encounters one, it might classify it as a pneumothorax incorrectly. So as is, is helping guide um, industry and anyone else who's trying to develop these to make sure that they're doing it as, in the best possible way. And then from that as well, we help break down the, the technical specifications. Because one of the other um, issues that we were seeing there and industry was telling us and other folks are telling us too is that yeah we can say at a conceptual level i want to detect a pneumothorax but what does that truly mean is it just we want absent present do i want absent present un unknown are there other details that come along with it um especially when you get into developing um, artificial intelligence algorithms that has a really big impact overall on how you have to develop these and how you have to train these so what we need to do here then is we take those different examples and say here are the exact outputs and inputs that you should be able to expect to work off of. I mean every single output we have, um, we are putting into the RAD as a RAD element CDE, with the idea then being that each one of those RAD element CDEs then we're working with the standard bodies to make sure there are standard mechanisms to send it, to communicate those findings through DICOM and Fire and HL7 and other such things. But that way, as a, as a developer or as a, or as a clinician, I have a standardized set of how to describe these. Um, we also have another part we have called secondary outputs. 
and kind of the, the separation there is a primary output is to say to accomplish the minimally viable product of what this use case is describing, you must have these. So pneumothorax detection, you must be able to say, is there a presence, absence, or undetermined pneumothorax there? But then where these secondary outputs come into place is oftentimes these are the, the next question um, a physician or a user would have is, okay, so there's a pneumothorax. Well, I also want to know, is there pleural separation? What's the side of the pneumothorax? What's the size of the pneumothorax? Is there a chest tube there or not? These are things that if, as a developer, if you want to go a little bit beyond the minimally viable product, maybe this scenario you want to be more robust in, um, here's additional things you can do to bring greater value to the scenario. And then also we, we have a, a section at the bottom that's a little more kind of musings or ideas. The idea is these are future development ideas on how maybe the, this type of scenario might grow in the future, how it might be used in other use cases in the future, how their use cases might connect up to change things and have, and have some greater kind of synergy overall. But a lot of times these are areas to kind of say, this is, this is what the panel and, and public folks were thinking about while reading these that we said was out of scope for this right now, but are definitely areas to build upon overall. So that, that was one particular example. Um, I kind of like to do is kind of go over this grid to kind of show, I think, just how vast this overall area is. So if you break down all of radiology based on its specialty, uh, based on anatomy, based on modality type, based on finding, what you end up getting is just thousands and hundreds of thousands of different scenarios off of here. So if you took one, like we said, pneumothorax, if you take another one such as an MRI of the knee for MSK, but look in the posterior um, crucial ligament tear, you know, that, that might be one other particular use case to go after. And so then if you start hitting that and you look at everything possible out there, then not just, you know, here's all the different use cases you could possibly do for MSK of, of MRI, but then here's possible every single possible use case of just MSK. And then often you get to, here's the possible of all use cases everywhere in all of radiology. And even this, I think, is a bit of an understatement because what you know we, we know is, is that this is, is medical imaging and, and, and healthcare overall is an area that continues to grow as we get into research. So this would just be the area that we know of now. And so a lot of what ends up being then to, to really go after these different areas and areas is to help find what are the spots where that have high clinical value and are solvable by AI because we know them well enough, we can help describe them and help make data sets that can work off of it. And that's what we try to go after with these uh, touch AI use cases and be able to uh, review these, develop these, bring them to industry so that way industry can start working on these problems and then bring these back to our clinical workflows to actually have them start having impact on our patients and on our overall um, care. So I want to flip things over to Laura, um, who's going to go more in depth on our certified AI as product or not product service and go from there. Um, let me go ahead and make you presenter. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so thanks, Chris, for going over the, the, uh, the touch AI use cases. So what we, what, as Chris mentioned, once you've developed a such AI use case, um, uh, and a developer has developed an algorithm that, that um, meets the criteria of the touch AI use case, then one of the things that we want to do is certify uh, the algorithm. So I'm going to kind of walk through a little more specifics on the, our certification process. And then I'm, I'm kind of walking through, we're going from touch AI to then you certify to then you need to get your algorithm implemented. So I'm going to talk a little bit about ACR assist, which some, some of you may um, may or may not be familiar with, and then finally end up with our with our Assess AI. So uh, our certified AI algorithms um, have a specific methodology that's based on, you know, what is the, the uh, response to the, the, the specific um, data type. That, so is it, you know, is, are we looking at location, segmentation, are we looking at uh, measurement or, or, or you know, what, what is it we're looking at? So we're de developing our statistical metrics um, on that. And then, of course, uh, one of the basis is to make sure that we have a lot of variability in the data set to cover all the possible uh, parameters that, that might um, affect the algorithm. And, and we want it to be repeatable. So basically, um, I'm just trying, hang on a second. 
So basically, we're, we're, we're going to create a ground truth data set, and that ground truth might either be, you know, we might have pathology data as results, or we might be using a, a, some kind of reader study to have uh, multiple readers come through and, and use that as a, as a representation of our ground truth. Um, and then, you know, figure out what are the metrics we want to use and uh, um, establish our acceptance criteria, and then run the analysis and, and generate our reports. So the idea would be to create a whole network of, of facilities across the country that are contributing data to this ground truth data set so that we have all of the differences that we want to consider, like things like, um, you know, different types of scanners, different demographic populations, different, um, you know, acquisition parameters, all of the different things that go into uh, uh, how, the, how the algorithm is going to work so that um, instead of having all of the algorithm trained and tested on a site uh, on data from a single site, we have representative data from, from all across the country. So this is just another look at, at the way that this, um, the, at the steps that we need to use to evaluate the algorithm. So our touch AI use case specifies the trigger. So for example, in the, in the pneumothorax example, um, you know, a, a, a chest x-ray is going to be uh, the image that triggers. And a lot of these early on use cases center around, you know, image interpretation. But as Chris was mentioning, we also have a um, non-interpretive panel that has quite a few work groups in it that are looking at things that are not based on image interpretation. And I, I did, while, you know, while we have you all on the phone, we did, I did want to make a plug for the fact that, um, you know, we are we are interested in you know help with our, especially with our non-interpretive panel, but any of these panels in terms of having you know medical physics, physicists give their input. And with the non-interpretive, there are a lot of use cases that I think that that you all might be able to come up with. So um, so if you're interested, just just let us know. So so then I, I also wanted to be clear that all of these. Um, validation, the evaluation of the of the algorithm depends on the touch AI use case. So there's kind of like a one-to-one -one correspondence between the use case that you developed and what you're validating against. So um, if we if we continue on with the pneumothorax example, you have this touch AI use case that said specifically what is going to trigger the algorithm, what exactly you're measuring, and what the clinical context is. And it also lists the sources of variability that you need to to include. So once you have all that, then we can ahead of time, a priori, calculate, uh, figure out what the performance metrics are going to be that we're going to measure it against. And those performance metrics, um, well, d depend on on you know what what the data type is. But then um, you also have the acceptance criteria, and the acceptance criteria may depend on you know what what the clinical time context is or what you're going to use it for. So it, for example, with pneumothorax. You might be using the algorithm just to um, bump up the the read in the workflow and the radiologist workflow. So if you know there's potentially a pneumothorax there, you want that to get read up front. But you might be using it to decide whether to send somebody you know from the ER to, whether to admit them or, or or for for some other clinical reason. In which case, um, the acceptance criteria might be very different. So different acceptance criteria depending on you know what what the data is going to be used for. Um, so you you um, create your reference data set to make sure that it has all of the variability required. Set your acceptance criteria and then you run the algorithm and um, run run your statistical metrics to see whether or not it meets those criteria. So this is just an example with a pneumothorax, continuing on with the pneumothorax. So um, in, in the pneumothorax certify AI, we list specifically what the specific reference data set looked like. So we do a sample size calculation and say, for our presence absence of pneumothorax, for our primary um, metric, in this case, which is going to be um, sensitivity and specificity, we need a sample size of 1,730 images. So we collected 1,730, and those came from 12 different facilities. We describe exactly how we created ground truth. And in this case, the, um, we had about a 50-50, 46% prevalence of pneumothorax versus, versus not. So, um, you know, 54% normal, 
44% with pneumothorax. Then based on the sources of variability that we listed in the use case, we're gonna, we're gonna describe how many, what percentage of those are actually available in our reference data set. So uh, we set the criteria that we needed to have at least 10% of the cases have those specific um, sources of variability. And then this is uh, the criteria that we use. So, so we said that you know, for even for prioritizing something in a work list, that we wanted to be pretty sure if we prioritized it higher, that uh, we we were pretty sure that a, a pneumothorax was there um, if we said it was there. So we set that at 95%. On the other hand, if we said that a pneumothorax was there and it really wasn't, that's not as big of a, a risk. So we set the criteria at 90% for that because it's, it's not a big a deal as if you prioritize something and you know once the radiologist goes to read it, it turns out it's not there. So these are the kinds of things that our panels are you know, uh, uh, considering when they develop these use cases. Um, and, then, and then we, we Run, we use whatever metric we decided on, the acceptance criteria that we decided on, and then we generate a report based on that that the, that the developer can then use to take to the FDA. So that's essentially um, a certify AI. So I did want to talk a little bit about assist because once, like let's say the developer brought us their algorithm and we certified it and said, yeah, Based on you know our validation data set, it looks like you're good to go. And they take it to the FDA, they get it, they get it approved, and they're ready to implement it in practice. Now, how is that algorithm going? How are we going to be able to incorporate that al algorithm in practice? And that's where um, ACR Assist comes in. So ACR Assist, there's actually a, um, an open source schema called Cards uh, that it's, it's basically an XML schema that allows you to put structured data. Um, into into a, a radiology report, and ACR Assist is one of the uses that XML schema, but also incorporates ACR um, guidelines or ACR guidelines such as um, or, or guidance, I guess I would say, such as the RADs, all of the LIRADs, PIRADs, BIRADs, or incidental findings. So the idea is that here is that when the radiologist is reading, he's got his image and he's got the report. And more and more of these, the 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 image and the report are getting integrated, but right now they're they're kind of separate. So you can see that you could run an AI algorithm straight from the PACS or the scanner on the image, and you could get some results. So it could come in and circle for you. Essentially, here's some findings that I see. Then you've got guidance like the RADs and incidental findings that could bring structured data. Um, to the radiologist at the time of reporting into the report. And so you can have a whole um, uh, data flow, a, a whole flow diagram there that kind of leads the radiologist to make sure he includes the discrete data, structured data for that um, particular finding. And that can get it incorporated into the report. And then because we're structuring it, and we've got it um, encoded in this XML schema, we can then take that data and put it back into a registry or feed information back to the ER. So this is just another look at how what that structured data looked like. So the blue box is the data element. So you've got the data element itself and the response encoded in that blue box. The decision tree or the rules, um, you know, so, so, so for example, for LIRADs, it's showing you, you know, if which, which uh, branch of the tree you're going down and leads you down that, that's the yellow box. And then the gray box is the report template um, that, that, that based on what you pick comes up. And I, I do want to point out here that with the whole uh, common data element effort and our whole assist effort, um, you know, the idea is not necessarily to have the entire report be structured, but whatever the component of the report is um, that, that you're having guidance on, that that piece of it would be structured so that you can use that, that information uh, downstream in things like registries. So in terms of how um, AI is going to feed in, into all this, um, initially with our assist modules when we created them, the idea would be that the dictation system um, would incorporate that structured data and you would have to you know, either voice dictate and it would turn that in uh, to the structured algorithm or you'd have to point and click to all of the data that you want. So that's our our initial pass at ACR Assist was sort of a manual um, filling in of this data. 
with AI, we can now automatically populate a lot of that data. So the size of the nodule, the LIRADS category, all of that stuff could be automatically populated um, by an AI algorithm or some portion of it. So in the middle row here, I've got, well, one of the elements, the size is being filled in by an AI algorithm, but the rest of it gets filled in um, by the radiologist. And in the last case, you've got fully, um, full ACR with uh, ACR assist with AI, where all of the information that you need structured is coming from an AI algorithm. And then the radiologist is just checking to make sure that they agree with, with what's there. So um, this is kind of, kind of one way that we see that, that AI might get implemented in a clinical workflow. And then this last one, you'll notice I took away all of the information behind the LIRADS category, and the AI is only giving the LIRADS category. So I think um, initially, we're going to want to know all of the data that goes into the making decision about what the LIRADS category was, because people are, are not going to trust that it's giving the right category. And potentially over time, we may come to find that the algorithm can figure out the LIRADS category without having to find all that data and we trust it. But I think, you know, right now, this whole idea of explainable AI, we kind of want to know a lot of that background information that made it, that why it got the decision of being a LIRADS 2 so that when we go back, we can figure out, um, uh, you know, what, what it went into that decision. So finally, um, We've got our algorithm all implemented in a clinical workflow and we're using it. So now we want to come and, and use Assess AI. So Assess AI we're using to monitor how, once the, once the algorithm gets implemented, how it's working. Um, so the idea here would be that, just like we were showing with Assist, you could populate those algorithms, but then the radiologist may come in and change things. And so what we'll be doing is recording both the output of the algorithm as well as what the final um, output of the radiologist was and then you can do a comparison um, uh, to correlate how close the algorithm and the radiologist response is and you can do this across all different types of you know parameters populations and and to see um, where the algorithm is working or not working so you can imagine an algorithm that you know you've approved and been implemented now all of a sudden there's a new you know a new scanner type or some new technology that comes out and you're running the algorithm and now all of a sudden it's not working and you know potentially you could catch that. So all of that data gets fed back into essentially a registry just similar to, to the dose registry so that you can do all this analysis. And that analysis can go back to the developer. It could get, be used um, you know, to, to communicate with the FDA and it could use to go back to facilities so that they can see whether or not their algorithm is, is working correctly. And so this is a slide that came from the FDA, and the whole idea is that if you're if you can successfully monitor the algorithm when it's in the field, then you can decrease the amount of time that you have to have on pre-market. So, so you could let something go out there if you're pretty sure it's working okay, if you know that you're going to monitor it uh, on the other side and be able to pick up whenever it, it stops stops working. So um, yeah, I guess we'll open it up for questions now, but I, I, I just want to reiterate, number one, that um, we'd love to have anybody who wants to come to our QNS conference on uh, that, that's using a, in combination with AI, with an AI twist on October um, 27th and 28th. And also, if you're interested in being on one of these panels and, you know, particularly our non-interpretive panel, then just uh, let us know. I've answered a few uh, short questions in the question uh, mechanism, but if you have others, uh, please go ahead and submit them. So here's a question. Has DSI looked at how medical physics graduate program students can be involved in such activities in terms of course modules offered at the university, thesis projects, to summarize how future medical physics workforce can be prepared in a better way to get on with this challenge? Short answer, short answer is no. Uh, get, getting us uh, on the same page with the medical physics profession is just now, uh, just now getting underway basically with this, with this webinar. So we've got a ways to go in that regard. Um, I know that medical physics has a lot to offer. I know having uh, spent uh, six and a half years working in a camp up accredited graduate program and residency, residency program that there is AI work going on. So, uh, yeah, there, there's a. Uh, it's really important that we all get on the same page and figure out uh, 
who can contribute what to this effort. Yeah, and let me just add that, um, you know, we've talked about having uh, an informatics fellowship or an AI fellowship around or a DSI fellowship around similar to what quality and safety does for, um, you know, where you come two weeks to the ACR and you learn exactly about what we're doing here. And I think potentially we could have one specifically for medical physicists to get them involved. I think that would be a, a good idea. That is a good idea. So I don't see any other questions right now in the box. Uh, so we'll give it just another minute. If somebody likes your fellowship idea, Laura. I also like it. So question, is there a website or a mail server set up to contribute to and or read posted material? Hey, we have a website. We, yes, we <laughs> yeah. do. Uh, ACRDSI.org is the website. Yeah, and we have a, you know, for questions, we have a, we have a, you know, an email to just ACRDSI at ACR.org. Right. That's right. Yeah. Um, um, and there is uh, like a weekly blog post, right, on the DSI site, ACRDSI.org. There is. Um, there is a young physician section, I think, on, on that site as well, and also a resident fellow section. Uh, that's YPS for Young Physician Section, RFS for Resident and Fellow Section. We're getting ready to start a journal advisor um, club, so that'll have articles on AI and, and journalist picks, and there's, you know, ability to... There is a protected uh, space in the JACR every month uh, for data science articles. There was, uh, in the last year, there was a dedicated data science issue. So those of you who are ACR members, hint, hint, uh, have uh, complimentary access to the JACR, um, and you can go back and look at those uh, those publications. And we're, we're putting together another special edition of the JACR for um, the DSI as well for this next year. Great. So here's a great question, Chris and Laura. What's the timeline or time scale of this large project? <laughs> Uh, can I maybe I can ask a clarifying question on that? When you say large project, do you mean is there a project you have in mind over what went over, or are you saying the entirety of DSI? <laughs> My interpretation of this question is that it's a uh, the entirety of the DSI. So you know we're getting ready to launch these use cases at the Quality and Safety Conference, so we're going to have over 40 use cases that will get launched in um, at the end of October. And hopefully with the launch of those, we'll get public feedback and then we'll, um, you know, start to have algorithms coming in to use our certified AI. So I, I feel like the, the certified AI um, project, we have a number of pilot projects that are up, up and running. But, um, you know, I think as we get the use cases out there, we'll move that along. And then as algorithms start to get deployed, we'll, we'll move on with the SIS AI. So I think it'll kind of go in that, that direction. But Yeah, I mean... I, and I don't think any of these are like you complete a project and you're done. A lot of these are more ongoing aspects. I mean, I guess the way I've kind of been looking at it is a lot of our main areas we're going after, we get to the point where I would say it, it's solid. Now it's more a matter of scaling and adding more to it. It's probably more in like the two year range, like the point where you'd say like anyone can just point to this and it's probably solid, um, right? And once you go beyond that range, then it, it's always hard to say what the future is going to be at that point, right? Because at a base level, I, I think I'd look at it and say at that level, it'd be more, one aspect I think will happen is it'll be about just adding variety to this, adding more and more use cases, having more and more um, certified AI evaluations for those use cases, adding the assess aspects. But, you know, it's not clear then is what new opportunities and what new challenges arise as those roadblocks are knocked down. Um, and because our, our major, our goal in all of this is to essentially help go through these roadblocks as much as we can so we can bring this to patient care. As those new roadblocks come up, we'll have to continuously evaluate is that an area that, that A, we need to be in, and if so, what can the ACR be doing to help knock down those future roadblocks? I have two good questions in the hopper here. Uh, one of them, uh, is the ACR working with any of the large data companies such as Google, or uh, MicroStrategy, why or why not? Okay, I, I'll stay down. Um, yes, but let me qualify that yes. So we, we're vendor neutral, uh, but we work with a very large variety of vendors, including the ones you mentioned and many others. Um, and it's not, there's not any kind of like contractual thing going on with these. It's more about 
these companies, you know, they're coming in and they're saying, you know, there's a niche we're focusing on. It's like Google has their niche and, you know, GE has their niche and all these different folks have their own aspect they're trying to go after. But they're going to exist in this greater ecosystem that's yet to really come to fruition. And so we're working with them to kind of understand where where is it that you, you're looking to plug in in all this? Where are the roadblocks you're seeing to help bring your solution to place? And how does that fit in in this greater aspect that we should be taking under advisement and how we should be moving forward? And um, we have a number of data science summits. We have at least two a year, you know, depending on the demand. We may, we may have more, but um, around different topics that are, these are kind of focused on on industry and, and um, developers. So our one we had the day before SIM last year was around the topic of economics because everybody wants to know, like, how are these AI algorithms going to get paid for? Who's going to, who's, what's the business model going to be? Um, we did another one around the whole validation piece. And so, um, it, it, we have an ongoing dialogue with industry and, and as Chris said, totally vendor neutral, but yeah. Last question at the moment uh, regarding patient data privacy. How do we ensure uh, privacy in such projects? Do we have any issues regarding patient data privacy? And <laughs> you know, who owns the data, for example? No, we have no issues with that. We've got it all solved. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that, that's a great question. And that, that's an ongoing, you know, concern. And so, okay, so it brings up a couple of points. So one is, um, you know, we're looking to put together a committee to actually come out with some uh, uh, white papers on this topic in terms of just what you said, what intellectual property, who owns the data, what, what are the data sharing issues, all of these things that I think everyone is concerned about. If you know, at an academic institution, if I get approached by an, an AI, you know, vendor, what are the things that I need to worry about? So, um, so we are looking to put that committee together. And, and if anyone, you know, is interested in participating in that, but your, you know, your participation would be very welcome. Um, another, another thing that, that I meant to bring up earlier is just, you know, when we're thinking about the certification, but also this assess AI is um, this idea of, distributed versus central analytics. And, um, you know, we've gone back and forth between are we going to collect all the data at the ACR centrally and then run all these algorithms there? Or are we going to do it in a more distributed manner where the data doesn't have to leave the facility, you can keep it there and we just bring the algorithm to the data and then get back all of the results and analyze the results centrally. Um, the the issue with that being that you got to make sure you collect all the metadata you need to do all the subgroup analysis that, that you would want to do. But um, but yeah, there's that's definitely a major concern. There is going to be a blog post about you know what some of these issues are in our. I think I don't know when that comes out, but in the, in the next you know uh, month or so. But and and I'll just, I'll point out one other point with that too is um, you know when you start at the level of you know patient privacy and data anonymization. Who owns the, the the data and go back and forth? There's a lot of different ways to, to cut it too. So I mean, one aspect you look at is just the legalities of it. What do you what do you have to go from there? Um, and that can vary based on federal versus what state you're in. Um, there's also the ethical concerns with it too. There's also just other contractual obligations that you mentioned, like depending on the type of organization you're in, how it's being shared. Um, and so I, I think it's one of those things that I, not to say everything's ongoing, but I think will be ongoing where. We'll, we'll probably do over time, and I say when I say we, I mean the group of everyone involved in all of these areas, is, is start to come up with different paths and best practices of what's what's most commonly accepted. And that's what we're I think what we're trying to aim for is with, with these white papers and different groups to say, here's the recommendations, and then we'll keep updating those as folks are using them, as we get feedback based on them, as real world examples come back, and that way we can help propagate those as best we can. That way folks aren't just doing whatever they can on their own, scrambling in, in the dark. Yep. Follow-up comments. The ethics committee at the site level would be needed, which I think you basically mentioned. You know, people need to sort out what's good for them, and yep. then we all kind of work together to come up with what's uh, what's best for the larger community. Yeah, and I do want to point out too, there is a there's like an international effort to put together an ethics statement that's not just, you know, so it's inner society. So, you know, ACR, SNA, and then uh, a, a number of, um, you know, other other groups that are going to put a, you know, white paper on ethics around AI together. And I think, I don't know, that's in the, in the next couple months that that'll happen. Well, I don't see any other questions, but I have a nice compliment. 
Uh, somebody applauds the ACR for establishing the DSI. Applications of AI in radiology are inevitably coming, and radiologists and medical physicists need to be at the forefront and be the drivers instead of being replaced. So thank you for that. Absolutely. We, we agree. We agree. Yeah. Um, so with no other questions uh, in the hopper, uh, thank you so much for your attendance. We hope that you learned something. Uh, DSI will have a booth at the Q&S conference at the end of October in Boston. I recognize that most of you are probably not going to be there. Uh, there will also be a DSI booth at RSNA. And based on uh, feedback uh, and word of mouth, we may try to do uh, another DSI update for medical physicists uh, in uh, five, six months, something like that, if, uh, if folks are interested. Um, so I have one follow-up question before we, uh, before we disconnect. Uh, how can we keep connected? Yeah, so I, I think it would be great if we, you know, we could have periodically have these, and maybe we can do, you know, a little more open discussion so people can talk. But I think it would be great to to have uh, periodic calls and and again for people who are interested in contributing to one of the or being a participant on one of the panels, just let us know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think if so, first first and foremost, I think. If you would like to participate, uh, when we have people on committees and commissions, uh, uh, phantom reviewers, uh, physician clinical reviewers, uh, in order to contribute to the ACR, you do have to be a member. So that is one qualifier. Uh, but if you uh, are a member and you'd like to uh, be connected, um, by all means, uh, reach out. But the other the other thing I want to bring up is that on you know we do have a lot of inner society uh, collaborations, and so mm -hmm. anything you know I I think. On uh, quite a few of these use case panels, we're working with other groups. So I think, in terms of, especially I can see on our non-interpretive panels, so there's going to be some use cases that are going to be very, you know, um, medical physics oriented, and we would want their expertise. So maybe representatives on, you know, specifically for those or to review things that we come up with. And one thing that I know that came up when um, when we were reviewing some of our use cases, when we're looking at those sources of variability. A lot of the panels do not have a medical physicist, so things there are certain acquisition parameters that they're not even thinking about. So we might think about some some way of having medical physicists review, you know, for each to review yeah. the panels to come up with, you know, hey, you should think about this, think about that. I don't know. No, I, I think I think that's that's, that's great, and that's that's and, and that's part of the reason why I think we're looking at some of these use cases. You know, why I think the public commenting period is, is such a big portion of this is that, yeah, you can get those experts to look at it and they'll come with some really good stuff, but what makes, I think what makes these really beneficial is just how robust we can possibly make them by having folks from all kinds of different backgrounds be able to point out missing details that'll add it. Because that's what's going to actually, I think, drive to the point where we can get this technology in a clinical work, in a workflow, in a clinical space and have it be useful and, and accurate. Um, the the couple things I wanted to quick mention is um so yeah if you if you're interested in participating anyway um you know please reach out to Dustin oh, otherwise our email is dsi at acr org I think we said that incorrectly before uh, that's dci at acr org it's also on our website acrdsi org um, and then uh, what also might be useful too to think about is you know whenever I always kind of feel odd when you do kind of just general update webinar kind of things because I mean not that the updates aren't good. But it makes it very driving on our side. I'd be very curious to see what are the what are the the topics that you're most interested in discussing, and we could maybe do that as the next follow up. Like, is it you know around a certain area? Is it around ethics? Is it around validation with certify AI? Is it around these different aspects? And we could do a much more in depth discussion based on that. I've always found those to be really interesting. Not that updates aren't interesting, mm -hmm. but that way we can really focus on what you're interested in as well. Good. We'll uh, we'll discuss how to best collect that type of information, Chris. I just send it all to Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll we'll figure that out. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, you get uh, about five and a half minutes of your life back. Um, so thanks again, and look forward to seeing some of you at RSNA and uh, chatting with you uh, the rest of you another time. Yeah. Thanks for joining. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day.